So we're getting settled in as best you can. Hope the accommodations are comfortable, suitable for practice. But I thought today I'd begin to move forward to talk a little bit about the, the path of progress. I'm always quite interested in progress. They tell you not to be too fixated on progress because it often relates to the future and it leads to expectations and ambition greed, worry, fear that you might not progress. What I'm going to talk about today is a lot of the uh, progress that you've already made. And so what I want to do is sort of solidify that foundation before we talk about the rest of the path. It's like if you want to build a palace, you better have a pretty strong foundation. And so, let's not be too quick to rush to build the walls and the roof of our house. This is a common problem for meditators, is uh, you'll get to the point where you realize you've been kind of rushing it, rushing ahead towards the results without working hard enough on the foundation. And then you have to go back and fill it in. So let's deal with the foundation first. We'll talk about some of the basics again. Uh, the Buddha, we have a, a book. Um, it's an ancient commentary called Visuddhimagga, which means the path of purification. And the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha himself called it the path of purification. He called his, his path. This is the path of purification. And when writing this book, that was supposed to be the outline of the Buddha's teaching and, and the Buddha's path, he started off by reminding us of a, a verse the Buddha said when he was asked by an angel, Anto jata bahi jata jataya jatita pacca. Which means the inner tangle and the outer tangle. The, the whole of um, the people, the people, people are entangled by a tangle inside, tangled up inside, tangled up with the world around them. This is an angel looking down on the earth 2,500 years ago. Imagine what they're looking at now. Oh boy, the tangles have just gotten worse. The inner tangles, outer tangles. We ask Gotama, who will be able to untangle the tangle? What sort of person can untangle the tangle? These were the sort of questions that angel devas asked the Buddha. If you read the Deva Samyutta, it's very different from a lot of the other teachings. It's very poetic. It feels very angelic. Sometimes it's hard to understand their questions. Their questions are often very sort of nebulous, uh, allegorical or, or, or metaphorical or that sort of thing, right? That metaphorical tangle. And the Buddha's response was what Buddha Gosa used to, as the basis of his book, the Visuddhimagga. The verse goes, Sile patithaya naro sapanyo chittam panyacca bhavaya atabhi bhako bhiko so imam vichatayi chattam. Sile Patithaya, founded on, having, having founded themselves or established themselves on Sila, 
or change behavior or ethics. Uh, a wise person, Nero Sapanyo, a person with wisdom. Based on, established on sila, they develop citta and panya, citta and panya cha bhavana. If they should develop citta and panya, citta here means focus, it literally means the mind, but they, they focus purifying their mind, right? And with that pure mind, uh, gives rise to wisdom. Ha ta pi ni a bhikkhu like this, such a person, the Buddha would, he's praising them by saying, such a person is a bhikkhu, a true bhikkhu. He's a true recluse, a true monk. Adapi, they are energetic, nipako and clever, discerning, right? Not just, not just listening to me when I tell you to walk and sit, but they're actually seeing clearly. Such a person will untangle the tangle. And so he, he used that as his basis, reminding us. It's nothing new. He reminds us that the Buddha ordered his teaching sila, then samadhi, and then panya. And so he outlined three parts to his book. The first part is sila, the second part is samadhi, the third part is panya. But I bring that up specifically because sila is our foundation. Remember I was saying we have to have a strong foundation and sila is the basis. So before you even come to practice, we have rules, right? If you're going to come to practice here, you need to keep certain rules and rules are an important part of sila. But rules aren't all of sila. Rules are the beginning of sila. Sila, the, the, there's called the, the fourfold sila, which is basically ethics, or it's the basic foundation uh, relating to your activities or your behavior. So sila is, in some ways, sila is always with us. It isn't just when you didn't break the precepts or when you promise to keep the precepts. Sila is the way you live, the way you approach your life, your day, your experience. So it's a very important, it's, it's a constant part of the practice in four ways. The first one is the precepts, so you don't break the precepts. You don't kill, you don't steal, you don't lie, you don't cheat, no sexual activity, no drugs or alcohol, no, we, no overeating, no entertainment, no uh, oversleeping, that sort of thing. Those are rules that are useful, they're helpful. If we do that, that will be a good, strong foundation for us to develop samadhi and panya. But the second one is uh, the requisites. And we went over this yesterday, so I won't go into detail, but a part of our sila is our use of things, so that we don't misuse things or overuse things, don't overeat. Uh, don't deck yourself out in beautiful clothes. Uh, don't oversleep or get attached to your dwelling or your bed. Uh, and don't abuse medicine, that sort of thing. The third one is our livelihood. And again, that really doesn't apply. Uh, but one of the great things of being here, someone mentioned today, how, how useful it is to come here. Because you don't have to... Uh, worry about your livelihood. Livelihood is now very simple for you. How do you how do you make a living? Go to the kitchen, pick up your food, go back to your, uh, find a place and sit down and eat. There, you can live for the day. Uh, everything is made very simple for you here. That's why meditation centers prevent, present an ideal environment. Everything is, is quite a luxury in some ways. Of course, the place doesn't seem luxurious, but the luxury is that you are uh, that you are free from the burdens of well, having to make a living, for example, having to go to work. It's uh, an environment that is very suitable for meditation. 
So having having a, a right livelihood. For, see, it's a, it applies to monks, where monks don't, don't go around begging. So for you guys, things like don't go looking for special food or, or um, going out of your way to take the last of whatever is, is really good or something like that, right? Don't be greedy. Try and be content with whatever there is. Leave some for everybody else. And that goes not just for food, but for everything. Just be content. The Buddha said, Subhara. We should be not burdensome in how we live our lives. But the most important, I think, in, in, in relation to meditation is the fourth part of sila, and that's um, the guarding of the senses. And you can see that in how Buddha Gosa describes it. He reminds us of uh, how a guarding the senses is really very much associated with mindfulness, and I've talked about that as well. But in guarding the senses, it allows us to see how sila First of all, how it's very much associated with the mind, which is something we don't always notice. We always think of sila as the physical things. Don't kill. Well, that's a physical activity, but it really isn't. The problem isn't the killing. The problem is the mind that intends to kill. Right? If you step on an ant and didn't know it was there, well, bad luck for the ant, but it's not unwholesome in your mind. You didn't have any unwholesome intentions, so it's not a breach of sila. But when you think of it as guarding the senses, then it's really every experience becomes ethically, uh, potentially ethically charged. When you walk, walking can be ethic, ethical or unethical. Boom, boom, boom. Sometimes when you're angry, you walk very loud, you know? They say you can tell the difference between someone who is greedy, someone who is angry, and someone who is deluded by the measure of their steps. Now you're all going to be checking. A person who is angry, boom, boom, boom. They step with their heels mostly. A person who is greedy steps with their toes. Doom, doom, doom. Is there? They're keen here. They're, they're eager. And the person who is deluded has no pattern to their steps. Sometimes with their toes, sometimes with their heels, sometimes wide, sometimes short. This is the sort of person who doesn't have any real pattern because their minds are all mixed up. But they also say, and this is to keep you on your toes, is they also say that uh, it's not a very good indication because when people know about it, then they can alter their <laughs> steps. So now you're all going to be altering your steps. So, no, it's a, it's a good reminder to us. We can say, oh yeah, this is, look at what I'm doing. Why I'm stomping is because I'm angry. But if you walk angrily, that's an unethical act. If you uh, speak angrily, that's unethical, of course, right? Even if you, if you wish someone well, but you're angry about at them, it's still, still unethical. Uh, and, and that then goes to simple experience. There's a story of a monk who stopped to smell a flower and there was this angel living in the flower or in the forest or whatever, and it said, Thief! Thief! And the monk went, what, what is this? Stealing the smell, you're stealing the scent, right? Because he's a monk and he shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> it's un unethical to... Now, in, in your ordinary life, you're not going to be that concerned about these things, but here, it, it's not a... It's not sin, you know, like we're not really all that uh, vindictive or, or hateful or, or no, we're, not, we're not like demanding. These aren't commandments. The point is that this is helpful. If you keep your mind pure and clear and just objective, you'll find you have a greater peace, right? You've been here for a while. There's moments of peace that maybe weren't there before. You start to get that as you start to free yourself from your judgments, from your partialities. So try and work with that when you see or hear or smell. Remember, uh, in everything you do, think of it as, as ethically charged every moment. And we can keep ourselves uh, pure and uh, 
when we're mindful, we free ourselves from the stress of the, the, the energy that it takes to, to be partial towards things. So that's ethics. This is called, this is the first purification. So this is not from the commentaries, this is in the suttas, in Majjhima Nikaya 24, there's an enumeration of the, uh, the seven purifications, the seven Visuddhis, and that's another part of the Visuddhi Magga, he, he separates it out based on these seven things in the Visuddhi Magga, or in the Dipitaka. So Sila Visuddhi is the first purification, it's the first part of the path. But that doesn't mean that once you've done it, then you can put it aside. It's really just the foundation. And in some ways, therefore, we call sila the, the actual practice. When you're mindful, when you're walking mindfully, when you're sitting and you're experiencing the stomach rising and falling, just as an example, is pure. You know, then, then your sila is pure. Your behavior, your, 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 right? Because meditation is like an act, it's a behavior. So as you perform the meditation, so it's the most ethical act you can do when you walk mindfully, when you sit mindfully. The second purification is called Jitta Visuddhi. And Jitta Visuddhi is the whole of the Samadhi section. Samadhi is one single thing. It's, uh, it's the development of uh, the mind. It's the purification of the mind. It's called Chitta Visuddhi, which does literally mean purification of the mind. And it's a little bit surprising, I think, when you first hear this, to think that this is only the second of the purifications, and it's not actually the goal. Because right? we think, well, the purification of mind is the goal, isn't it? But the problem is, the mind is not a, th a single entity. And if you're pure, if your mind is pure right now, you've probably noticed that that doesn't actually uh, ensure that your mind is going to be pure the next moment. Mind is just a moment. Each mind has a moment of existence. It arises and it ceases. And so some of our minds are pure and some of them are not. And they come and they go. So we're trying to do something actually a little bit beyond just purifying the mind and uh, basically purifi purification of view, purification of our understanding that through experience, which is the whole rest of the chapters, uh, our mind is unable to not be pure. Right? We cultivate purity through our practice in our mind and that purity leads to vision and it's that vision that keeps our mind pure keeps our mind from getting uh, impure. But first, before we can see clearly, our mind has to be pure. We do need these moments of, of purity. And there's different ways to go about that. You can undergo a very strenuous uh, process of cultivating just pure mind states, where your mind is perfectly pure, you're not interested in wisdom yet, you're just focused on something that calms the mind and purifies the mind and you have this very strong and no hindrances, no liking, disliking, drowsiness, distraction, doubt, just an alert, pure mind state. And if you do that for a while, the power of that can be very useful in cultivating wisdom. But it's also possible that, um, well, that in and of itself doesn't lead to wisdom. No matter how you do it, eventually you have to come to the point where you apply the quality of your mind, the purity of the mind, you apply it to your experiences. And that's what we're doing here. What we're doing is kind of a, a condensed course, because there's so many things we could teach you, and it could take years to really cultivate these intense states of calm and then maybe even gain magical powers, remember your past life. Some centers, they actually do that. But ultimately, it's, it's not necessary to, do, to go to that length. It's just more um, thorough and more powerful, let's say. But here we have 14 days, and don't, um, don't discount 
the greatness that you can get by focusing on what's actually important, and that's this momentary concentration focused on momentary experiences. And it's different, it's, it's better in that it's focused on things that can actually help you understand how your mind works. For example, there's meditations where you focus on the Buddha. Focusing on the Buddha will never teach you directly how your mind works because you become so focused on the Buddha as an idea or metta, may all beings be happy. It's very wholesome and very good. But as long as you're focused on beings, the ideas of people or all beings or one being, it doesn't matter. You're not going to be focused on the actual experience uh, on a momentary level. So what we're doing here is uh, taking our level of concentration and applying it to our experience. Because you haven't spent all that time developing your concentration, it's a little harder in the beginning. There's no question. But I hope you can see that after a few days, instead of taking months or years to develop uh, very high states of concentration, even after just a few years, you're able to do it at the same time. So this is called samatha and vipassana together, technically speaking. You can do samatha first and then later practice vipassana. What we're doing is both of them together. So you're at the same time you're developing concentration, you're also developing wisdom or clarity because the focus of our attention is on our actual experiences, which are able to give us wisdom. So that's jitta visuddhi. That's what you're struggling with now. You find your mind is sometimes pure, is sometimes impure, and as you practice, you'll start to see more moments and states of purity where you're actually able to experience things clearly. The next stages, and this is, um, sort of where you guys are now, or where you've just come through, that i um, just, just going to go over again, so that we can sort of solidify our foundation. And then uh, on another day I'll talk about some of the more later stages. But once you've cultivated samadhi, and you start to cultivate this clarity of mind, this purity of mind, based on your actual experience, you start to learn things about reality. You start to understand reality more clearly. On the first day, uh, this would have been the first, well, the second reporting session or third reporting session in the at-home course, I asked you a whole bunch of questions that some of you might vaguely remember about when you step, stepping right, stepping left. The right and the left, are they one thing or a separate thing? And when you sit and say rising, falling, are the rising and falling one thing or a separate thing? And I had to get the right answer or else I couldn't give you the next step. This is relating to the, the, the third purification. This is called purification of view. You don't have to remember all of these, just kind of get a sense of what I'm talking about. The point is, this is where you start to be able to see things as they are. See, it's, it's a different sort of perspective than we're used to. We're used to looking at reality as things, cups and phones and, and rugs and people and places and so on. Concepts, these are concepts. This isn't what we actually experience. And so underneath all of that is the seeing of the cup or the seeing that gives rise to the idea of cup in the mind. The hearing that gives rise to the idea of the meaning behind the words. Or the hearing of a bird or a dog gives you the idea of the bird or the dog. But at the basis is the, is the hearing, is the experience. When you walk, stepping right, stepping left, ordinarily we think of this as, I'm walking. These are my legs moving. But as you practice meditation, you see underlying that, the only way I, I have an idea of I'm moving or my legs are moving is because of each individual experience that actually arises and ceases. At the very base of this reality is, is what gives me the information that tells me that I'm walking, and that's the experiences. And 
those are momentary. So stepping right arises and ceases. Stepping left arises and ceases. This is like opening the door to a new reality or a new perspective on reality. When you sit and say rise and falling, the rising has a beginning and an end. The falling has a beginning and an end. Everything, every experience has a beginning and end. And then I ask you whether when you watch rising, is there only the rising or is there also the mind that knows the rising? So the other thing you learn here is that there is two parts to this experience thing. There's the objects and there's the subject, or the mind, right? the knowing of it. If your mind is off somewhere else, you don't know that the stomach's rising. It's only when the mind is there as well that there is the knowledge of the rising. So this, is, this purification is crucial and very important, but by this point it probably seems kind of banal. But just think, if you hadn't ever looked, if you hadn't ever taken this perspective of seeing experientially, you couldn't ever start to, to break apart your reactions, how you react to things, how your reactions lead to stress or suffering and so on. So it's the very first step towards wisdom. It's the very first stage of, of wisdom. This is in the Banya section. Purification of you, it means seeing things in the right way as they truly are. The fourth stage of, uh, the fourth purification is called Kamkavi Dharana Visuddhi. And this relates to uh, right and wrong and sort of, it has a lot to do with why you're here. Like if I tell you greed is bad, you might question that. A, sort of a person, an ordinary person might, is it really Anger is bad. Sometimes it's good to get angry. But when you get to the second stage of knowledge, it's hard to avoid the truth that some things are just not good on, a, on, a, on an experiential level. And you start to see that. You see this leads to this, that leads to that, cause and effect. So it's after seeing what exists, you start to see how things relate to each other, what, cause, what experiences, what realities cause what. We have questions for that, we're sort of testing you to, to, to see if you get there. And once you get there, then we'll kind of, uh, we, can, we can rest easy because we know you've started to get on the right path because you start to appreciate why you're here, what is the benefit of mindfulness, and what is the importance of it because you start to see that you have inside some bad causes, some things that cause suffering. You start to see how it's not other people that are causing me suffering. It's, it's us, our habits, our reactions to things. The fourth uh, purification is called Manga Manganyana Dasana Visuddhi. And this one I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. Magga Magga Jnana Dasana Visuddhi. So I said you, you in, in the second one you already get an idea of uh, right and wrong. But you still have to, you know, it's, it's, it's more like in Kanka Vitarana Visuddhi, you, you start to see cause and effect. In Manga Manga Jnana Dasana Visuddhi, you start to put that to use and, and pick out which is right and which is wrong. And in the beginning, that is just seeing what causes you suffering. But it actually goes deeper than that, and that's what I want to spend some time on, is that you can actually lose your way and get onto the wrong path by following something positive, something good. This is a, an important part of our explanation of insight meditation, that you're all sort of on good, good ground with, but let's just firm up the ground and, and make it very clear that um, this is an important thing for you to keep in mind. What do I mean by uh, good things can lead you astray? Many of you have already kind of taken the task for this or just reminded you um, 
because there are so many good things that come once you start to deal with the bad things. Once you get a hang of anger and greed, you know, it still comes up, but you're less scared of it, you're less overwhelmed by it, you're less under its power, you do start to calm down. You should all start to, don't worry if you don't really, but you should all start to feel some calm, some peace. And most of you will start to think that's the path and you, 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 you dwell in it. And we like it. Some people will see lights and colors and, and just follow after them, dwell in them. So I've said to many of you to be vigilant. It's not a bad thing. Happiness isn't a bad thing. Calm, these are good things. They're a good sign. But as soon as you take them to be a good thing, you're in trouble because you're going to get a, a sidetracked by them. So I can't tell you they're a good thing. I won't let it. Don't, don't tell. Don't tell anybody. They're not actually a good thing. These are good things that we call uh, byproducts. They're good as, as fruit. And they're good as a fruit of the practice, like a reward. Like if I give you a ribbon because you, uh, or I give you, put a, a sticker on your, your, your paper because you had a perfect assignment or something. It's a sign that you're doing good. But you don't stop studying or stop going to school because, you know, you, I, got, I got this star. The star is a sign of, that your practice was good. So there are many good things that come up and they can sidetrack us. And they're not a problem until they uh, prevent us from doing what it was that allowed us to start to experience more positive experiences. Right? And that's be mindful. Happiness doesn't lead to happiness. Goodness leads to happiness. So we always practice goodness. We never practice happiness. Don't just dwell in the calm and think, oh, now my practice is good. I'm just so calm. No, the result of your practice is good. Your practice has gone uh, to waste because you stopped practicing. There's 10 of these, 10 things, uh, it could be more, but they enumerate 10 things that are called the vipassanupatilisa. They're the defilements of insight or defilements of seeing clearly. And upa means they're kind of not exactly defilements, they're not evil or bad things, but they're, they're imperfections. They, they can cause problems, not because of what they are, but because of how we relate to them. So you might see things, as I said, see lights, colors, pictures, all sorts of crazy things. Maybe you feel very bright in the mind. Nothing wrong with that, but it is important and easy to forget that you should not see anything. So just stay with it until it goes away. Another one is called jnana, uh, they're out of order here, but let's say jnana is next. Jnana is knowledge, and this is one I don't think I've talked about. You can gain a lot of insight through meditation, through this meditation. You may have noticed that some problems in your life, you get solutions to them. Or even just about the meditation, you just start to understand. In the beginning, maybe you didn't understand about mindfulness enough. I get it, I understand it. And you think, well, why is this a bad thing? It's not a bad thing, but again, it's the result. It's not the practice. And if you cling to it, you stop practicing. Clinging in the sense of thinking about it, going over it, extrapolating it, revisiting it. Sometimes you think, oh, when's the next one going to come? What more could I learn? And then you're into the future. So it takes you away from being mindful. Anything you, you, any learning you gain, any insight you gain, any epiphanies you have, all of these have to be taken as a good sign, but a potential problem if you get sidetracked by them, and if you forget that they're the fruit and not the practice. So even when you know or think, you have to say thinking or knowing, and if you like it, say liking. Third, we have uh, piti. Piti I talked about, but here Piti is a little bit different meaning. The meaning here is some kind of uh, very visceral sort of rapture. Like have you ever seen these religious people who uh, go like this? There's, I saw a documentary of people who actually you know, felt like that was God or something. I'm like, eh, practice meditation a few days, you'll get the same thing. 
They don't need God. It's not really God. Uh, but it feels like it. It feels often very, uh, very external. Like you're not doing it. You're not causing yourself to shake. So you can gain all sort, get all sorts of ideas about what it might be. Uh, but it's piti. It's rapture. The mind gets into a concentrated state, and you are subtly, or the mind is subtly uh, encouraging it. And so there you have, you say, shake, uh, shaking or swaying, and. One of, the, one of the teachers I was listening to, he said, sometimes it won't stop and you have to tell it to stop. You have to say, stop. And he said, because the defilements are naughty. He said, kide do do is the word, naughty. They're, they're tricky. Our defilements of mind, we trick ourselves. We think, oh, I'm not doing this, this is great. Stop, you can tell it to stop. Sometimes naughty isn't enough. Because it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not a bad feeling. I did that. When I first started, I was like, oh, no more pain. This is great. <laughs> no, I'm, you're not learning anything. You're not going to gain anything from that. So it's, it's not bad. It's just a waste of time. That's all. So these are things just to keep in mind that uh, you're not putting your time to best use. To be mindful, not angry or upset. It's not a bad thing. Just mindful. Let it go. Other kinds of rapture, you might feel goosebumps, you might feel energy. Some people feel this exhilarating energy going through their body. Some people start crying. And this is rapture, but they're, they're not unhappy. They're just crying for like hours. Some people laughing can be uh, yawning apparently. Um, light. Light in the sense of feeling light, you can feel very light. Some people apparently actually levitate, but I'd say feeling like you're levitating is probably more common. You've probably heard these myths about people levitating. Apparently it's possible, so believe it or not. I don't expect you to believe it, all of you, but apparently you can actually levitate. And there was one story of a guy who said, you know, I was actually levitating. And his teacher said, oh yeah, well then take this pencil and uh, when, when you feel yourself levitating, make a mark on the ceiling with the pen or pencil. And he did it apparently. This is a story I've heard. Like he actually did make a mark on the ceiling. So believe it if you will. Uh, but you'll feel light often. Just say feeling, feeling or light. But again, it's it's not bad. It's just an experience. Don't get sidetracked. Uh, don't get distracted by it. That's all. It's not a problem. Just take it as an object of mindfulness. Um, we have then happiness. So we've talked I've talked to many of you about many of you about this. Happiness is a good sign, but not some not a part of the practice. It's not practice just being happy. You have to say to yourself, happy, happy. Otherwise, there arises liking, and then you're upset when it's gone, or trying to get it back, and only satisfied when it's there. Calm is another one. Uh, calm, not calm, but um, quiet. Quiet is a common one. Um, well, for some people, they'll feel very quiet. And it's a, a common problem that uh, we often hear from, from people who have been practicing for a long time in another tradition. They'll say, well, I'm, I'm feeling very calm and there's nothing to note. Or, or, sorry, I'm feeling very quiet. It's so quiet, there's nothing. And so then you would note it's placity. It's, it's an actual state of mind. And you would note quiet. And just get quiet. You can also say nothing, nothing as well, but quiet is the best. So it's easy to get sidetracked by that because you feel like there's there's nothing to note, it's just quiet. So you should note quiet, quiet, or even knowing, knowing that it's quiet. It's just a state that arises and ceases. Uh, upeka, you might feel very equanimous. Some people feel just completely neutral about everything. You'll start to feel neutral about things that you'd normally be reacting to. Meditators often describe before they would be very reactionary to pain or to thoughts or to sounds. Maybe the person next to you, their alarm beeping, and you're no longer angry, angry about it. And you can get excited about that. You can get attached to that as well. So if you feel calm, just note that as well. Make sure you don't sit there smoking. Ooh, I'm such a good meditator. Look at me. Not reacting, saying that you're not a good meditator anymore. 
just to, just something to keep in mind. It doesn't mean to be bad or evil. It's just something we have to remind ourselves of. And then we have how many? We have one, two. That's six already. And then the, the next ones relate to qualities that we're trying to develop. Um, confidence. Confidence uh, is a very common one. Uh, at certain points, at a certain point in the meditation, probably around where many of you are now or have just come from, you're going to feel very confident in the practice. There is a time. There, there comes a time where you feel like, "Wow, I, I, I just." This is such a good thing to be practicing. I don't know. Maybe some of you are doubting as well, so don't be discouraged if you don't have this. But it, it, it can happen. Sometimes meditators will um, feel like they want to ordain. They'll, they'll be sitting there and think, I just have to dedicate my life to this. And they'll start to think about, I'm going to go home and I'm going to ordain and, and just give up the world and so on. Uh, another common one is you'll think about family. Oh, I have to get my, someone said today, you know, I want to get my, my parents to, to practice this. And these are good thoughts, but you get sidetracked by this. You get so confident and so appreciative of, of it that you just start to think about, I'm going to go home and I'm going to teach all my uh, friends and relatives how to practice and tell them all about it and they'll all love it. So, you know, those of you who have experiences with courses before, it, it isn't always quite so easy. But regardless, it's a real distraction. Confidence. You be, if you become confident in the practice, it's a good sign. It's a good sign that you're confident in things that are beneficial to you. But uh, just make sure you're noting as well when you feel that. Another one is energy. You might feel very energetic. As you practice, you should sort of throw off this burden of, of fatigue and drowsiness. And over time, you start to feel a great amount of energy. And that can be a distraction, simply because you start to appreciate it. And you feel like, oh, I have so much energy, and get distracted by it. So just make sure you're noting even these good things. Right? And the, the ninth one is mindfulness. So even mindfulness can do this to you. It's a common thing for a meditator who finally feels themselves able to be mindful, even effortlessly mindful. Right? They're suddenly quite happy about that, excited about that. Like, oh, I can note everything, you know? I'm just so mindful. <laughs> Some people even think they're enlightened. You know, they get to this point and they think, oh, I'm, just, I'm there, I've, I've, I've figured it out. Look at me doing this step, take the right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> mindfulness, even mindfulness can get you on track. Anything good, because it starts to get better basically. And as it starts to get better, you start to get complacent and, oh, finally, something I can just relax with. It's not going to go away. It's not going to be a danger if you keep being mindful. It's actually going to continue to get better, right? That's the whole point, is it'll stop getting better if you stop being mindful. You'll stop becoming more clear. Your mind will stop purifying. Your purification doesn't happen. And finally, the last one is kind of a bit different. It's called Nikanti. Nikanti is sort of translated as desire. And it's, I guess, included here because it relates to all the other ones. So it's kind of distinct from them. You could say you can become uh, uh, like, you can like um, other things, like senses. This is a common thing. You'll see nature around you and just like it. Or you hear the sound of nature and just like it. Or you taste the food that you... It's just so, oh, this food. I, I never appreciated food so much before. I'm like, I've been hungry all night. And, oh, this food is so good. So Nikanti can arise there. But uh, it also says that Nikanti is really related to the other nine. Nikanti is what causes a problem with everything else. All of these good things arise. And it's because you get excited, because you're attracted to them, because you like them, that you get sidetracked. So it's important that you note as well liking, liking, even liking of the good things, because that's what initiates. It's kind of this subtle liking that initiates the attachment and the diversion. And that is Magga Magga Nyana Dasana Visuddhi.
knowledge and vision, purification by knowledge and vision of what is and is not the past. And so it goes deeper than just not knowing, or than just knowing um, that bad things are not the past. It's also the realization that even happy and pleasant experiences are not the past. It's an understanding that actually, out of everything that I've experienced, mindfulness is the past. That's what I'm hoping that you can realize here. I'm hoping that you can get from this. I, you know, I believe it truly. And I see that some of you are starting to see, or hopefully all of you are starting to see the, this uh, truth as well, that mindfulness is truly useful all the time. And that's when the path really begins. At that point, you enter into the, the path of practice. Up until that point, you're kind of on the path, off the path and you're just learning what is the path, in many ways very hesitant. And so at this point, it, your foundation is considered to be secure. And there's not so much guidance that we need. In the beginning, we need a lot of guidance, sometimes turning you through and then zig, you don't know, go the other way. You know. After this point, it's just a matter of adjusting and making sure you don't get off track in the dislike way. So that's a uh, description of the foundation, and I'm cutting it in half there, so we say the foundation, and next time we talk, I'll talk to you about, but I have something else to talk, we'll see, but I'll talk eventually about the rest of the path. In brief, I don't want to go into too much detail, because otherwise you'll, you'll uh, you know, get ahead of yourself, and you'll start expecting, thinking about the future. But I'm going to, I'm going to try to lay out a map for you, and we'll try to talk about where we're going, right? Why are we doing this? Is this really what I want to do with my life? Give you an idea of, of well, hopefully, you know, provide some sort of calm and, and reassurance that this is a beneficial and, and wholesome and helpful path. Just more and more things that help to provide encouragement. I think all of you are doing quite well in your practice. It's great to see so much um, vigilance and, and, and sort of um, dedication dedication to the practice. So I appreciate all of you very much and thank you for coming and hope that you do gain uh, truth and, and peace and happiness and freedom from suffering. I've been talking a lot today and I'm going to stop there. <laughs>